There we go. Great, you can't see me, but this is Jim Denniger. Hi, Jim. I actually can see you. Oh, sure, you I, can. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, I I've can't see a... myself for some reason. The, the way this is configured, but that's a blessing in disguise. Well, we will we will get there soon. And so, thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations on the new book, and I will reiterate that in a couple of minutes as well. Thank you, sir. This is this is a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. You and I had an opportunity to do this uh, years back when you had in defense of a liberal education. And I was at a group called the Greater Washington Board of Trade, and we were at the Ronald Reagan Building on Pennsylvania Avenue. I remember that. I remember that very well. I was very surprised by that because I, I didn't imagine that, that would seem like an unlikely kind of book club, but, uh, but it was great fun. It was a lot of fun. Great conversation. We had a wonderful group of people that day, as I remember, and quite a few of them venture a year after the, after the program. So it was kind of you to stay with them. Um, now, how many people do we have tonight? Do we know? Last count I had this afternoon was about 160. So I think we're probably pushing the baby 200. It would be um, all across the country, obviously, for us. I don't understand it. And I realized that it was helping me handle it psychologically to sort of think through the historical parallels, th think through, you know, what, what the likely trends were going to be. And so for me, in a sense, you know, people ask me, how have you handled uh, COVID? Well, my catharsis has been writing a book about it. And I hope very much that it helps other people. Well, I think that it will. I, I believe that uh, it already is selling quite a few copies. I've talked to several people who are going to be joining us tonight. And they said they already bought the book. They've been reading the book. They're halfway through. So I'm not going to ruin the ending for anybody because we do want them all to get a chance to read it. But I do want to start off with a couple of quick observations and get your thoughts on them. This is a book that if it weren't for the pandemic, in many respects, you would have just written a book called 2030, that this would have been a 10 year look into the future, maybe a 20 year look into the future. But one of your central themes seems to be that the pandemic has accelerated everything. It doesn't necessarily change everything. It accelerates some big uh, trends that have been developing for a while. Globalism, is it the end of globalism? We talk about not just data, but we talk about connectedness, societies, inequality. And you are not the uh, sort of Pollyannish by saying everything's gonna be fine after this, we're all gonna return to where we were. You do talk about the fact that here we are on Zoom. A year ago, I had never heard of Zoom and now it's second nature. And so could you spend a minute with us on the acceleration of things as an underlying theme of this book? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Jim. So there's a great line uh, that I found uh, from Lenin. Um, now, I should say, as a good journalist, I did try to check it. It's not <laughs> entirely clear that he said it, but it's uh, too good to, uh, to not use. So Lenin is supposed to have said, let's put it that, this way, that there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And that really is the nature of this pandemic. It is not so much uh, altering the path we're on, though in some areas it may, but mostly what it is doing is it's putting the world on fast forward. It's taking things that were happening and really ramping them up. Best example of this, as you say, is something like Zoom, but think about telemedicine. It was proving very difficult to get people to be willing to see doctors uh, on Zoom or on any kind of electronic device. People wanted to you know, have the comfort of actually having that physical contact. And doctors, by the way, were very uncomfortable with it for a slightly different reason. They weren't getting paid right. for doing these uh, electronically. So what COVID did is it broke that psychological barrier and it broke that financial barrier. Uh, Medicare began to co-pay, you know, to pay for these visits and other insurance companies started to do it. And within weeks, you had levels of televisiting between patient and doctor that people didn't think we would achieve in a decade. So this year, 2020, we will have 1 billion uh, telehealth visits in the United States. Now, the part that I wanna just, just point out is while it is an acceleration, when you have a very dramatic acceleration, it is in some ways a change of, of quality not just of quantity or speed. So the thing I worry about most 
with COVID. And, and it, it's a big complicated subject, but if I had to pick one thing I worry about the most, it is the dramatic rise of inequality that we are going to see at almost every level. You know, one of the great good, good news stories of the world has been the reduction of global poverty. That's right. Well, you know, 450 million people have moved out of, of poverty, extreme poverty in the last 20 years. The World Bank says 100 million of those are already moving back this year and it will probably get worse. So, you know, it's not, it's not just acceleration. When you have rapid acceleration, you could end up with, just imagine what I was describing with that poverty number. Imagine the social, political, psychological consequences of this dramatic turn. Well, you do in many respects within this book, these chapters, these lessons don't stand alone. You talk about inequality, but then it ties directly into globalism. If everybody starts to shut their borders again, and we all start to retrench and do our manufacturing in our own locations and only sort of uh, eat what we grow and stop the imports and the exports, well, we hunker down, but what does that do for the inequality with other nations when they have been on the rise. When you look at the um, pandemic and the implications for people, I'll say the service workers uh, who really don't have a choice to be working from home. They have to go to their location, whether they're healthcare workers or uh, in the hospitality business or otherwise, and they have a higher level of exposure. And in many respects, they're also not the largest wage earners. And so this exacerbates some serious inequalities and there's not a, a, an easy fix to them. But first, of course, is being aware of the situation. And I think a large part of what your book does is it puts a very strong highlight on these systemic and, uh, and, and pandemic problems. Yeah, you know, the point you made uh, right at the end, I think is one worth underscoring, you know, because we're all on Zoom. And, you know, many of the people listening are probably students. And so your life has been changed and altered and it's inconvenient. Uh, and it's, you know, and it's uh, not as fulfilling in some ways, I understand, but you're getting a lot of what you normally would get in terms of the in instruction, the interaction, the reading. So your life is not that different. I think about me, you know, me professionally, it's awkward. It's, it's not what, you know, it's not as good as the real thing, but I'm able to function. That describes a lot of people who are in that digital world, you know, that the 30 to 40% of the country in the United States, at least, they can basically function digitally. But for everyone working in a restaurant, in a hotel, at a retail mall, on a cruise ship, in a theme park, in a movie theater, this is like the Great Depression. And I think we do need to understand uh, how different and how disparate that, that, uh, uh, that, that effect has been and so, as you say, first understand it, there are, we're lucky that the United States, the government has the capacity to provide enormous amounts of help to people who, which it should do because these people are you know, out of work for no fault of their own. Um, but you're going to see this, this, uh, this difference between those who are able to function in a digital economy with some difficulty, but, but at the end of the day function and those who just cannot, and it's, and it's, and it's all over the world. You raise a flag, a big flag, and you say, this is about on inequality, that inequality in America looms worse than ever. COVID-19 heightens all of these divides. It will cut America in half. Can you spend a little time about what you mean by cutting America in half? Because I think you make a very cogent case through this lesson. So if you look at what, the, you know, what is clearly the biggest problem in the United States right now is our deep uh, political division, our deep polarization. We are watching it play itself out as we speak. Now, the reason it is so difficult and, and uh, divisive uh, and why each side seems so opposed to the other is that these political divisions are actually the, uh, the, the iceberg on the top of the water. Underneath these political divisions, we have developed deep cultural divisions social divisions. So there's a very good article in The Atlantic saying the biggest divide in America turns out not to be race, not to be income. It is density and diplomas. In other words, if you live in a densely populated area and you have a diploma, chances are you voted for Joe Biden. If you live in a sparsely populated area and you do not have a diploma of some kind, chances are you voted for Donald Trump. And that divide 
you know, which is geographic, it's cultural, it's about the kind of work you do, the kind of education you have, you know, the kind of food you eat. Those divisions have become much, much greater. And now what this digital divide is doing is it is going to exacerbate them and drive them apart because ultimately the people who have diplomas and live in more densely populated areas are much more able to survive a digital world, a world in which there are fears of pandemics than people in that other category. So my fear is that you are, you are going to see this divide widen and the class resentments that build up uh, with this division are only going to get worse. So, so this is an area, this whole area is not one where the pandemic has, you know, has helped. It has actually deepened these divisions. So Fareed, I'm going to take from the United States and we're going to go over to Paris for just a minute. It's the yellow vests. And these are people who have real resentment against the people who live in the city that are saying, you can't do this with travel. You can't do this with fuel prices. Uh, and they feel put upon by whether we call them the elites or not. But then I would ask that you bring that back to the states and talk about how the pandemic has exacerbated that great divide, urban, urban and rural. Well, so you're exactly right. If you look at this division, um, you see it in France. The biggest uh, protests against Macron were from people who were in rural areas, mostly without diplomas, um, and, and they were resenting you know, what was essentially a gas tax because they felt that they didn't you know, take the subway to work in Paris. They drove a couple of hours to get to wherever they needed to. And that same divide was true for Brexit. It was the metro areas that all voted for uh, staying in the European Union, and it was the countryside that voted against. You see the same division in many ways in countries like Turkey and India. And so it's, it's, it's a much larger phenomenon. Um, what has made it very peculiar in America and, and charged it in particular during the pandemic has been that it has created this distrust and, and disgust with um, elites of every kind, including the very doctors whom we may need to listen to to get through this pandemic. So one of the things that's happened in America is that mask wearing has become a political sign. Well, why is that? Because it is a reflection of this deep class resentment that we have developed. There are people uh, you know, in, in these so-called red states who think that they're being bossed around by you know-it-all know uh, technocrats with fancy degrees who live in uh, cities that uh, they would never want to, to live in and uh, uh, you know, telling us all, telling the rest of the country how they should live, how, what's healthy, what's not healthy. Uh, and you know, so, we, so it's, even the science has gotten caught up in this divide uh, between the, the, uh, you know, the expert and the non-expert. Well, you spend some time about the issue of trust. And if trust is not there, what it means for governments, not just the size of governments, but for the quality of governments, for the inability to deal with other countries. Uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on all 10 of the lessons. There are a couple I'd like to drill down into, but on inequality, you're not just talking about individuals, and obviously the results would be for individuals, but you talk about the companies. I, I guess I would say that the big get bigger and the small get put out of business in many respects. How are you seeing this inequality uh, become sort of more real every day? Let me give you a, a simple example, Jim, that comes from the, uh, the, the uh, it's strange because I talk about it in my book, but my book itself has become an example of it. So publishing is actually an industry that has, uh, I hate to put it this way, but benefited from the pandemic. Book sales are up. Uh, it turns out not everybody is watching Netflix. There are a few of us <laughs> who are actually reading more. So because we're reading more, book sales are up. But before COVID hit, Amazon in the United States represented about 30% of book sales. As far as I can tell, Amazon today re represents over 60% of book sales. So book sales are up, but the big news is that Amazon has doubled its market share. Now, that's probably not just Amazon, right? It's probably true for Home Depot. It's probably true for Walmart. These companies that have huge digital presences, that have in deep supply chains, that have inventory, that have strong credit lines, that have very big national or international brands, they survive. But the small mom and pop hardware store, 
the small independent bookstore, those are of course the ones getting wiped out. Now, this is again an acceleration. We were already seeing a consolidation that was taking place. One of the most disturbing things that's been happening in the American economy has been this, this sort of trend towards monopoly and duopoly in almost every area. But again, what the pandemic is doing is, is it's exacerbating it. Look, in New York, where I live, I noticed, you know, there, one of the great features of every city, of, of course, is lots of restaurants. In New York, of course, a whole bunch of restaurants are closing down. Now, which are the ones that seem able to survive? It's the fancy chef who has six restaurants, uh, you know, a chain because they have lines of credit, because they have the, the, they even knew how to apply for the CARES Act money. Uh, they were able to turn two of them into, uh, into delivery uh, systems, or they were able to use their brand uh, and set up a couple of outdoor venues in Westchester. But the little mom and pop restaurant that was opened by this brilliant young chef, even the ones, by the way, that got Michelin stars right. and that kind of thing, they can't survive it. So let's talk a little bit about not just New York, but cities overall. Uh, you're not claiming the death of the great American city. You are talking about how in history, cities like London were decimated in a variety of different times and came back oftentimes stronger. But this pandemic seems like it's opening up people's eyes to maybe I don't have to be in the city. Maybe I don't have to commute an hour and 45 minutes. Maybe I don't have to put up with all of these people. Maybe I'm not going to get back up on the public transportation and I don't want to fight on the highways. And, and so uh, this is a little bit of a, a back and forth because it's going to lead to the 15 minute city in a minute. But before we get to the 15 minute city, uh, when it's Paris is the example you use in the book. I'd like to hear your thoughts about, is the pandemic accelerating a, a leaving of the cities that would be a permanent hit? Yeah, this was a tough one um, because I really found that I, I needed to every, you know, your instincts are, of course, everybody's fleeing the city and people were fleeing New York. And if you look at suburban real estate markets, they're, they're, they're going through the roof. When you read the history and you you study the subject, you get a little bit the the the, the view is more complicated. So to begin with, we are in a very long term sense in a great trend towards urbanization. So if you look over the last three hundred years, four hundred years, the basic trend has been more and more people everywhere in the world are living in cities. They're moving out of the countryside and living in cities. Uh, that that you know you look at that trend in Asia because they're still developing in a way. And it's extraordinary. I mean, you're going to have 20 or 30 cities in, in uh, China that are going to have more than 10 million uh, people uh, each. And that trend is continuing apace. So in a very broad sense, we continue to urbanize. If you think about the, back, the backlashes that cities have faced when these, these kinds of pandemics or floods or fires have raged, they've not tended to be very long. I mean, I took great comfort in reading about Florence during the bubonic plague. Right. The, the, the bubonic plague basically killed about half the, the people uh, in Europe and half the people in Florence, therefore. People fled, they went to the countryside, they, they holed up in suburban villas, uh, what one would now call suburban villas. Um, they would sit around uh, in, in, uh, and uh, eat nice meals and tell each other stories. In those days, there was no Netflix, so you had to, you had to actually make up the stories yourself. But then they came back and within 75 years, uh, there was the Renaissance, which began in Florence and all the cities of Northern Italy. The, London, as you said, built back better from the great plague and great fires of the 17th century. It turned a city that was built in wood to a city that was built in brick and stone, the city that we, we know today. Um, Jefferson hated cities. And so when the yellow plague hit Philadelphia, he was sure that cities were done done for. Uh, it was a bad plague. It, it killed, it, it, it decimated Philadelphia, literally, meaning one out of every 10 residents. And Philadelphia was the largest city in America at the time. And he predicted this is the end of cities. I think the reality is going to be this. We do have new technologies that make it possible, as you said, for people to say, I don't need to be right, right here. So I think you will have partly a revival of the suburbs. But that isn't really the death of a city because the metro area still lives and survives. You know, the question of whether you live 
in a Westchester suburb, you know, that is arrayed as a, as a satellite or in a solar system in which New York is the sun, or uh, you don't, it doesn't really, it doesn't change it. There's a certain ma matter of economics and taxes and things like that. But from the point of view of the fundamental drive to be urban and to live in places where you are, you have access to, uh, to other people in urban life, that drive clearly is going to continue. Some people may choose the suburban model versus the urban model. And I think that, that we can get to, as you say, with the 15 minute city. Let but I think that, that won't change. What, what will change is I think we will have a slightly different work-life balance. Um, it's quite possible that, we, that uh, people will say, as you said, I don't need to be in the office every day. I need to be there two or three days a week. Um, I, I'm only going to go in for meetings or whatever it is. And so you'll work out of your house for a day or two, work in an office, travel for a day or two. And that is quite possible. You know, it's a kind of we work might have failed, but the we work model uh, of an idea of using the office almost like a hotel where you need you rent when you know you use a room when you need to, you don't have it permanently for yourself. That might happen. But I end with just one point. The reason people go to cities is very simple. And this will appeal, appeal to a school of business. You make more money if you go to a city. This is very thoroughly and exhaustively documented. You are more productive. You have higher wages. You're going to do more deals. You're going to meet more people. The economic opportunity uh, of being in a place where people gather, compete, and cooperate is irresistible. So we're, we're going to go back to that because I do want to talk about not just being digital, but the importance of social, the importance of being together, not just, in fact, you will make the argument that it may become more valuable to get together because we've been kept apart. And so those dinners, those gatherings are going to be even more special, though people will be working from home. Maybe they don't have to go out to every conference. I'll interject, we're pretty bullish on WeWork and part of that is because you don't have to take the seven to 10 year commitment that I don't know what the future is going to be over the next seven to 10 years. And while they may have been down, they seem to be getting back up and potentially the people who have been taking space from them may be taking more space in order to get some distance between them. But I do wanna spend a minute on the 15 minute city and you ask what will the city of the future look like Paris is the place to watch in this regard. You talk about the mayor and that she's proposing a bold new plan. Uh, and this is a, a plan that has, well, we're worth everything that anyone might need in a typical day is accessible by a short walk or a bike ride, grocery stores, work, park, schools, cafes, gyms, doctor offices, all would be reachable within a quarter of an hour. You talk about zoning and the issues associated with it there, but Give me a sense about how bullish are you on this 15 minute concept where instead of here's the area of downtown where it's entertainment and here's the area of downtown where it's finance district or the rest, that it's a, more of a 15 minute city, not just New York, but everywhere. So part of what made me start thinking about it was I remember reading an essay by a very distinguished architectural critic once and he said, notice that the kinds of places in cities that people like to visit uh, almost as tourist attractions because they find them so compelling. And he said, you know, it's Greenwich Village in New York or Brooklyn Heights or Georgetown and Adams Morgan in, in Washington. And what do those, those places have in common? What they have is that, that life is all mixed up. There's a kind of rich texture to life. There's retail, there's restaurants, there's some office buildings, there's a lot of residential, and that, that, that kind of complicated mixture gives people a sense of life and energy and buzz. And I thought to myself, when thinking about what would people want to come back to a city for? Well, the, you know, the main thing is they're not gonna to want to be in a city where it takes you one hour to get from the residential district, which is one you know, distant part of town, to the office district, which is another distant part of town, where if you, you know, where you're spending your time navigating these large distances, what they're going to want is what's lovely about a city. The best thing about a city is that you can walk to places, that you can get from one place to another very quickly. If you can't walk always, it's a five-minute drive. You know, it's a, I think of a, a place like Washington. Um, and 
places that are able to maximize that feeling, that it's very navigable, it's very manageable, that your friends live close by, that nothing, you know, you know, nothing requires time. Cities are going to have to maximize that feeling because that's their core advantage. And so the city of the future becomes what this Paris mayor and Higalda has come up with, which is the 15 minute city. She says, you, we should have a city in which everyone can get to a school, a grocery store, a bank, uh, you know, a retail, a theater within 15 minutes. And that is in a sense, the city of the old. The city of old, of New, you look at New York or London or Boston, was cities of neighborhoods, collections of neighborhoods. And each neighborhood, you know, Beacon Hill, the Back Bay, the South End in Boston, each one had its own little ecosystem. So I suspect that that's what will attract people. Can I ask then, as we talk about cities, because we're going to go global in a minute, and then we're going to open it up for questions and answers from everybody online. Uh, says in your book that the profits of cities inevitable decline have pointed to Zoom and other tools that allow work from home. But it is becoming increasingly clear that remote work is a fantastic tool, but an imperfect substitute for actual human contact. You go on to say, when you teleconference, you are spending social capital rather than building it. Could you expand on that? Because I think it's a, a great point that will restore people's confidence that, yeah, we all will be together again. Well, if you think about it, when we have, you know, I, I do my, my show and we have our, we have our team meetings um, and they're great. And it's wonderful that we can manage to do it. As I said, I feel very fortunate that we can continue to work uh, with, despite all this because of these technologies, but it's, it's very different in quality from the kind of the, the way we used to work. Um, when we worked before, we, we'd be in the office, and I wasn't in the office every day, actually. I would, I would, particularly the days I was writing my column, I would stay home and write. But most of the days, we were all together. And there'd be a little bit of banter, and there'd be a little bit of comradery, and we'd get, get into the conference uh, hall, and people would be talking about their personal lives. And then we would get to work, and we would figure out what to do, and we would execute. Now, all those those ancillary conversations, all that soft stuff has all disappeared. Instead, we just work. We just talk about, okay, what's going to be on the show this week? Now, what that means is, first of all, you lose all the social capital you've built to, for example, get people to really work hard this week because we've got to pull two all-nighters because the show is going to be complicated. Well, because you, know, you don't have the same morale. You don't have the same camaraderie. Okay, when we bring in new people, when we bring in interns, much harder to integrate them because it's easy to do Zoom and teleconferencing when everybody knows everybody else and we've all worked together. But what about the new guy or the new gal who comes in and how do you integrate them? Um, how do you find new opportunities? How do you hear new ideas? All those things are, are, are being left you know, on the, on the floor right now. We'll get through this, but one of the things I found is that we are now actively trying to ask ourselves, are there ways that we can just build social capital or, you know, the way we are, we are operating? So we're trying to do a, you know, a, so we normally go out for a Christmas dinner. We can't do that. So what we're doing is we've hired a chef who's going to do a Zoom uh, uh, dinner, which we're all going to cook together. Um, we'll all be on Zoom simultaneously. We've picked a time that uh, kind of will work for people despite the, no matter what the time zones. And this one guy is going to orchestrate it. All and right. The idea is just to create chit chat for two hours so that we build a little bit more of that social capital back. You, you, um, you talk about that social capital and you refer to Aristotle and you say COVID will not short circuit this hard wiring of the, of the humanity. In fact, the isolation of the lockdowns might have the opposite effect, reminding humans of the simple but profound insight by nature, we are social animals. And you go on to say that humans create cities and cities make humans. And, and that, that back and forth is a critical element, just the environment. And I think that you make some great observations about how cities are responding to the pandemic, about how um, they are not only centers of commerce, but they're the, the most diverse places in the world are cities. And the inequality is a 
is a concern, but boy, you identify so many different pressures from all sides that it was such a thought provoking book and, and lesson by lesson. But if there's something before we go global that you'd like to add to cities, I'd certainly welcome it. Well, if you think about it, Jim, it is cities that created democracy. You know, it is, it is democracy begins in cities like Athens, um, but then it begins again in, the, in, the, in Europe, in cities uh, like Geneva, uh, and then of course spreads. One of the great things the founding fathers were trying to figure out in, in this country was in their views, democracy had only existed in these, so, in these small city states, in these little republics that were essentially uh, cities. Could it, could it survive? in this vast open space. And the reason is because cities create a real civic culture. They create a sense of uh, citizenship, of identity, uh, and, a, and a desire to be part of that, of that civic governance. So I, I, I think that it's one of the things we need to remind ourselves is that one of the th ways we figure out who we are and, and we define ourselves often comes from that collecting together and gathering together and saying to ourselves, you know, who are we and what are we trying to accomplish in the world? When we talk about things that people want to accomplish in the world and understanding that you're speaking to a lot of university students, idealist comes to mind. You actually write one of the lessons said, sometime the greatest real realists are the idealists. And I'll read your opening two lines. COVID-19 is a global phenomenon that has paradoxically caused nations everywhere to turn inward. The pain and suffering, economic hardships and dislocations have led world leaders to abandon ideas of international cooperation and instead hunker down, shut their borders and make their own plans for resilience and recovery. While we'll talk a bit about President Trump, you're not saying it's just President Trump and just the United States. This is happening all around the world. What are some of the bigger concerns that you have as people hunker down and turn inwards? Well, as you say, it's not just happening in America. A lot of countries around the world are saying to themselves, it's time to take care of our own. We need to, we need to uh, turn inward. Uh, these global supply chains have shown us how vulnerable we are. Um, and, you know, there's some legitimacy to, to some of those specific uh, issues. But what people don't think about is the extraordinary benefits that they have derived from globalization, from global commerce. I mean, at the end of the day, when we ran out of face masks, where did we get them from? China. When we are trying to manufacture these vaccines, where do you think we're getting all the glass vials? And why is it we're going to be able to manufacture a couple of billion vaccines within a few months? It's because when we are, we're not trying to just uh, you know, take what we make in the United States, we are relying on global supply chains. And most importantly, when you want to grow, how else are you going to grow? We're 5% of the world's population. If you want to have a vibrant economy, you got to do business with the other 95% of the world. So I think that that reality is there. But to me, what's most striking, and if I can just make this point because you were so kind to, to raise it, I feel it very strongly. You know, we've had this one pandemic and this, this you know, and it's terrible, and, but it's made us turn inward and become narrow and selfish. And I then think about the statesmen who went through the Great Depression, fascism, World War II, and they came out of it remarkably idealistic. They came out of it determined to create a world that was open to liberty, open to democracy, open for trade, uh, in which global cooperation became institutionalized. They, you know, if you think about Franklin Roosevelt, he began planning for this post-war vision of the world before he even knew that the United States was going to win the war. He was so determined that if the United States did win the war, it was not going to be in vain. It was not going to be to just build the old uh, a system in which people went to war every five years, but to create a new, more stable, more prosperous, more peaceful world. And if you think about Eisenhower, I mean, this is a guy who saw the worst, the German army fighting to the last breath, to the last soldier. And he came out of it determined, we, we've got to find a way to never have war again. You know, I think that when I look at those people and I listen to the so-called realists today, I, I, I think to myself, somehow, you know, you, maybe you need to see what real uh, nationalist, nasty competition looks like to make you recognize why 
we should still be hoping and planning for cooperation and peace. Well, and I appreciate that in your book, you don't say this is the way it has to be and that Fareed Zakaria says this is the solution, but instead you, you identify the issues, you also propose some things, some of them are huge. I mean, they're just enormous changes and some of them are already underway and it's good to recognize them. But I will say that as I started off with that theme about is the pandemic an accelerator of things, uh, I would like to spend a minute on President Trump and the America first. If this has been an acceleration of America first as we hunker down and close the borders and, and look inward, I'm curious about what changes, if any, do you expect in that regard from President Biden? Well, it's a, it's, there's no question that Trump represents a backlash to you know, the openness, let's say, more generally, openness in terms of immigration, trade, culture, ideas. Uh, Trump represents a part of America, not, not everyone who votes for him thinks this way, but a part of his, his base clearly feels, stop the world. I, you know, I want to get off. Stop this global trade. Stop this immigration. Stop all this, these cultural exchanges. Take me back to what America you know, looked like, which is often a kind of imagined America, but, but a return to a simpler, more stable past. So I think that, of course, there is no, you, you can't turn the clock back. You can't go uh, back to some imaginary past, but Biden will have to face that reality. You know, I think that with, with regard to something like trade, don't expect all the tariffs to suddenly be magically lifted. Biden will, will navigate that process carefully. Uh, I think in some cases with China, I, ex I expect the tariffs will not be lifted. I think with, with Europe, they probably will be. I think with immigration, uh, he will probably revoke some of the most more, more cruel aspects of Trump's uh, immigration policy, the, you know, the separating children, uh, maybe the, the, the Muslim ban, but he will be careful not to seem like he's suddenly flinging open the borders to, you know, to everybody. Um, there is a reality here. I mean, it's not just in America, it's in Europe. A lot of this populism is driven, for example, by a gap backlash against trade and immigration. And so on those issues, I suspect that Biden will navigate. But, you know, his heart, uh, his, and I say this not on the basis of any deep knowledge, just watching him over the years, is very much of, of the view that the United States has played an extraordinarily important role historically in engaging with the world, opening it up, creating this rule-based international system, creating an open, open international economy. And he's going to want to, um, to bring us back to that place. You know, he, he said at his press conference, one of the first things he said is, uh, you know, I, I said to the world leaders that called me, America is back. Uh, you know, I think he, he very much, he feels that very strongly. So now let me ask before we open it up for questions, um, you, you raise some very big points and a bit of my concern is when we get through this pandemic, are a lot of people going to actually start to think, well, I'm sorry, when, when did China become so big? When, when did China become such a, an important aspect? When did China start to pass us? And you actually have a chapter, one of the lessons, the world is becoming bipolar and you're not, you're not mincing your words. It's the United States and it's China. And that's the, that's the big split. Um, how big a concern is it to you that we continue to go down this separate path, separate, not just us, but they're going down a separate path, everybody developing their separate allies, if you will. And it's not just that America is the, the top of the heap any longer. We've got some competition. Do we realize it? And how big a deal is it as it relates to a bipolar world? You know, when I was researching the book, the, the, the numbers actually surprised me as well. I knew the United States was, of course, the largest economy in the world and that China was the second largest. But I didn't realize that China is now larger than the next four economies put together. In other words, you take Japan, Germany, Britain, and France, and you put them all together, and China is bigger. The United States, of course, spends the most on defense in the world, but I didn't realize that China is second, and it is larger than the next four defense uh, spenders, uh, expenditures put together. Ten years ago, by the way, if you would have looked at Russia versus China, the Russian defense budget was more than twice as large as the Chinese defense budget. And that has been completely reversed. 
Right. And if you look at some accounts, China is through this pandemic and we're in the midst of this pandemic. I think that's right. I think it is fundamentally through this pandemic. The Chinese initially mishandled it uh, and there was a certain amount of deception, but then they turned on a dime and did an extraordinary job suppressing the disease, not entirely because of just brute coercion, which is the caricature that a lot of people do. A lot of it is through very intelligent public policy uh, where they, you know, the key is always you, you, you test and then you isolate. You have to isolate those infected so they don't infect other people. That's why you test. We have been very bad at that. We, even where we test, we've not been able to isolate people. We've not been able to quarantine them. But back to China, the challenge we face is that we have never had a competitor like this before that is simultaneously a geopolitical competitor outside of our security system, outside of our cultural uh, milieu, uh, but not, not quite equal. We're still, you know, we're still number one, but a very formidable number two. Um, to give you a sense, when I've asked Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, when you look at quantum computing and artificial intelligence, the key, the two key technologies of, uh, of the information age now, Who's ahead, America or China? He says, it's, they're, they're probably even, but there are some areas where China is actually ahead. So that's, that's a very different world in which we're gonna have to find ways to compete, but also to cooperate. Well, um, you do not seen. want a world with uh, the United States and China both going at each other like a US Soviet style arms race. I think we've both enjoyed peace for many years or relative peace. I will say that you devote more than two of the lessons to big issues associated with China. And I, I call people's attention to it. We are going to go to questions from people on online. Sarah says, I truly enjoyed the book. I was impressed by how quickly you were able to process the state of the world. I'm curious at what you think the future of business and particularly business travel will be. How will the pandemic reshape the world in terms of business travel? So in the short term, I think you're going to see much less uh, than people realize. Uh, I think people are still going to be very wary. They're still going to use these technologies because the, the vaccine is not going to be a kind of instant panacea. Uh, take, for example, the Pfizer vaccine. First of all, they're only going to produce 30 million doses by the time, by the end of the year. Um, 15 million of those, I think, are spoken for by the British government. Uh, so that's only 15 million in the United States. It's a two-dose vaccine. Um, in order to transport it, the vaccine needs to be kept at, at I think, negative 90 degrees. So it's right. very hard to transport. It means, roughly speaking, you need, I think, like five to seven times as many planes to transport the same amount of uh, number of vaccines. All of which means, when you think about the challenge of vaccinating, you know, a couple billion people uh, in the advanced industrial world plus you know, China, India, et cetera, it's going to take a while. So when you imagine, it, you know, so as the person who asked that question, let, let me pose to you. Uh, a few months from now, let's say you're vaccinated. Everyone you know is vaccinated. Let's say that happens six months from now. Would you go to a conference in Istanbul where you enter a windowless, vent, you know, unventilated or poorly ventilated conference room, which is what most of them are, with 150 people from all over the world? And you don't know whether those people have been vaccinated, whether those people's vaccines are any good, whether, you know, you, don't, you can't ask for people's health papers. Are you going to make that trip? Are you going to go on that business conference? So I think it's going to start up more slowly than people think. Eventually, I think we will get back to it. But again, it'll be a little bit like cities. I think you will end up with a hybrid version. So imagine um, a corporate retreat where you were just taking your direct reports somewhere for a you know, quick morale building. Would you still do that or would you do it on Zoom? I don't know. I think that the big conferences where you are inviting clients to a fancy Caribbean resort and plying them with uh, food and wine and entertainment, those will probably continue to exist because those exist as rewards, as uh, you know, has kind of a benefit of doing business with some bank or the other. It's also an opportunity to network. But the ones that have a more of a routine feel of people checking in to share information with one another, everybody getting on the same page, my guess is those will be more done more through Zoom. 
the 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 cases where you you just needed to meet one person for a very specific thing you know the person already you're probably going to do it on zoom but never forget competition in all this this is the key to understanding business i think somebody is going to start getting on those planes and visiting clients and doing business and then the other people are going to say am i at a competitive disadvantage if i don't make that trip so you know it will start ramping up it, and and i think you know two years from now we may we may be surprised on the upside of how much business travel we have but my my main point is it's going to be a longer ramp up than people realize uh once you hear about the vaccine you have to remember there are you know billions of people who have to get it well and across the greater washington area travel and tourism is an incredibly important where you've got tourists 21 million visitors to the area each year that has quieted a great deal not just the restaurants and the hotels but the conferences and the convention center and more and the livelihoods that depend on it if this is going to be a stretched out period of time 6 months or a year or longer uh, these are these are events that get booked out 4 and 5 and 6 years in advance I'm going to switch the topic to um, healthcare in certain respects. A lot of politicians and political scientists may say healthcare is the most important issue in this country. Some say it is focusing on the economy and wages. Some believe it's racial equality. What do you believe is the most important issue facing this country and or the globe and how do we tackle this issue? Oh boy. Um that's a tough one. I would say for this country the most important issue is the the inequality that is driving this polarization because ultimately if we can't function as a political system we can't solve solve any of the other problems right i mean we have this is a very rich country it has enormous resources it has enormous human capital but we have been unable to get much done uh for years and years now there is no infrastructure that has been built in this in this country in 20 25 years we have not been able to do other than one overhaul of healthcare which is itself gotten mired in this division and paralysis we haven't been able to update the social contract in any way we haven't been able to you know i mean all the kind of i talk in the book about all the interesting innovative things that northern european countries have done which have allowed them to marry the dynamism of capitalism with some of protections for people so that they don't have to deal with the the ravages of capitalism we haven't been able to experiment with anything because we are just deadlocked and until we can find a way to function as a political system i mean the congress hasn't passed a budget in 25 years um think about that they we fund the government through these weird continuing resolutions uh that in, again mean that we have, there's never a strategic plan for the future now at an existential level climate change because if we get that wrong you know um we we may not we we may find i don't want to be overly dramatic but we might find life on planet earth becomes increasingly inhospitable which is a which is a big downside to try to protect against freed that that may be your next book we'll have to talk about that um another question you made a bold prediction that donald trump was going to lose the election which was rightful or rightfully so you said he says here um you were correct did you ever envision the president was not going to concede to joe biden and does his actions indeed paint america as less than the beacon of democracy as it used to be and i will say pre this question in your book you do address the fact that america in international eyes has diminished on the world stage and it's not just that you lay that at the that the president's feet but that this has been an issue partly because I I'm paraphrasing you it's not the decline of the united states it's the rise of other countries so with that in mind would you mind uh, addressing the perception of the united states and did you ever envision that the president was not going to concede to joe biden unfortunately i did conceive of this and about 3 weeks ago i wrote a column and i did did an opening commentary on my show where I, i outlined what i thought he was going to do or at least you know and i said look this is a danger i didn't predict it but i said this is you know we need to be alert to this danger and the danger is he's not going to accept the 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 defeat he's going to urge the state legislators in many of these states 
uh, to claim that there is ballot fraud. He's been preparing us for this mail-in ballot fraud for months now. Uh, and there is there is an outside chance, and, and it's obviously a very worrying scenario, but that the state legislatures could try to, because they're a Republican in the case of Pennsylvania, for example, um, or Wisconsin, they could try to send their own slate of electors to uh, to Congress when they are meant when they're meant to go in the middle of December and, and and vote. That is the technical point at which the president is voted on. Um, maybe there'd be two slates of electors, right? And I I would outline a, t- a terrifying scenario where what happens is because there are two competing slates of electors, uh, Congress says uh, we don't know how to choose, so both of you are going to be disqualified, which means that Biden will not get to 270. Now the constitution has a provision which says if neither candidate gets to 270, it goes to the House of Representatives, but it is not voted on by a one congressman, one vote system, which is which would have the Democrats would have the advantage, but by a one state gets one vote system by which the Republicans have an advantage. So there is a, a bizarre scenario in which this is possible. Now, what's fascinating to me is Trump is trying everything I described. The question is, is it going to work? I don't think it's going to work, um, but I am deeply dismayed that he is essentially the first American president to not to refuse to accept that there is a peaceful transition of power that has to take place. People say, well, yeah, he's within his rights to, uh, to test legal issues or, you know, Democracy is not made up just of laws and rights. It's made up of norms, of manners, of behavior, of ethical concerns. And what he is doing is putting the country through an extraordinary uh, crisis in which he's inflaming his base so that they will believe that this election was stolen. They will not accept the legitimacy of Joe Biden. And to the, the questioner's point, we're putting on open display this poisonous destruction or erosion of democracy in America. So yeah, of course, it's, it's terrible for us, but it's not just terrible because it looks bad. It's terrible because it is bad. Fareed, with that, I'm going to thank, uh, it says, here's another question. Thanks for the great thoughts. I wanted to know how the 5G advancements can help grow rural life and decelerate urbanization as more people in rural areas will have access to the services same as those in cities? Uh, that's a very good qu- question. And it's qu- quite true that I think if you have really good widespread broadband and particularly 5G, because what 5G really does is it turns the phone into a supercomputer and it makes it possible for everything to happen uh, you know, at a kind of scale and speed that uh, previously you required very, very uh, strong Wi-Fi. Uh, you could imagine a situation where these inequalities are lessened somewhat. And I think that will happen in places like India or Africa, where you know the peasants uh, who work on the farms don't have to go through the traditional model of moving to the cities, going to factories, working in these large factories and move it. That's how their wages go up. Instead, they will be able to work in some way where they are and there will be a kind of you know a bottom up um, uh, entrepreneurship that that industrializes the economy in a more disaggregated distributed fashion so i think that that that's likely i think that in the united states people already have a fair amount of access so i don't know that the leap is going to be as great it'll certainly be be useful and it certainly can have some effect but at the end of the day, the problem in rural areas is that you don't have um, either the human capital or the opportunities to create real continuous economic activity and innovation. So let me give you an example. I was talking to a businessman who uh, lives in the Midwest, uh, lives in Ohio, and we were talking about why it was that even though the Trump administration has been trying some ways foolishly with tariffs, which actually have had no effect, if anything, have had a negative effect. But in some ways, with some subsidies, they've been trying to revive manufacturing. And he said, you know, part of the problem is when you look at the upper Midwest and you look at these communities, all the bright young people have left. They've gone to Cleveland and Columbus and Cincinnati, if not New York and Chicago 
and LA and Atlanta and Houston. So who's left in these places? He said, you know, generally older people gen who are less risk-taking, generally people without as, as good prospects. So he said, you know who the two largest employers in, ru in rural uh, American uh, areas tend to be? Hospitals and the government. Now you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna have an economic uh, renaiss renaissance based on, on that. So there's a real structural problem with rural America. There was a tally done yesterday of all the counties that voted for Biden and all the counties that voted for Trump. Uh, the, the Biden counties constitute 70% of American GDP now, and the Trump county is only 30%. Now, I bet you, I haven't seen this analysis, but I, I, I guarantee you, if you ask what is the geographical space that those Biden counties represent, it's probably 10% of America. In other words, they take up 10% of the geographic space of America, but generate 70% of the GDP. And the, the, the Trump counties probably take up 90% of the geographical space of America, but, but generate only 30% of the 5G ain't gonna change that. This one says, I'm a great fan of yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, Fareed. This is a great fan of yours, Fareed. All right, I'll get one. Talking about ideal. <laughs> What is your position vis-a-vis -vis the concept of prosperity without material growth and investing in the individual and the community, dropping the GDP in favor of a measure of progress based on well-being and protection of our shrinking planet? And what would be the implications of this concept on inequality inside and between the countries? That's a lot. Good luck with the answer, but understand that that came from a professor here at uh, American University. Well, it's a very profound question because, you know, it's, it's something that we really need to ask ourselves at a very deep level, which is what does it mean to be happy, to be fulfilled? Um, and it, you know, and it, just in case you think I'm now going to suggest that everybody become a Buddhist or start meditating, let me give you a simple example. Uh, France is a country that, you know, we think of as they, they don't work or they're, you know, they're socialist or whatever. Labor product productivity in France is the same as that of the United States. In other words, they are as productive per hour worked per person as Americans are. The big difference is that they choose to work less. They take about three weeks more vacation than American workers do on average. Now, what they would say to you is, yeah, we do that. We forego the money that comes from working three weeks longer because we have a much better life. We get to spend a little bit of time with our families. We get to go on a vacation. We get some downtime. We get to relax. We don't need, you know, that, that marginal three weeks extra. I'm happy to make the trade off and make less so that I have a, a richer life in every other sense of the word. So if you start thinking in those terms and say to yourself, what really makes you happy and fulfilled? And maybe the pandemic is an opportunity, you know, because we've all been thrown in a situation where there isn't that much to buy, there isn't that much to travel. What you're doing is you're at, at home, you're stuck, you know, with your family and perhaps your closest friends with whom you have managed to do a little bit of socializing. You know, for me, one of the things that's real I've realized is so much of the fulfillment of my life comes out of that, out of those human relationships. I feel incredibly privileged actually that I ended up, my three kids, I have a son in college, a daughter at boarding school and another a daughter. And they ended up spending a lot of time home in a circumstance I didn't think I would, you know, I didn't think I'd see my, my son. I thought, you know, once he's left college, he's sort of flown the coop. Um, and to have them back and to be able to kind of reestablish your relations with them, it was wonderful. I mean, it, you know, it was, worth a hell of a lot more than a new a new car or a new house or something like that. And so if we can really think like that, I think it would be a, a kind of advancement for us where I'm not sure is how do you get off the treadmill? How do you get, you know, how do you stop thinking like that? Because in a sense, you everybody needs to do it simultaneously. But maybe one way is that thought leaders like the person who asked the question with given that he or she is a professor, start talking about things like that. And, I, and I, I do think there's a very profound insight in there. 
read uh, two things. One, I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to see this book. I don't. I know I've got background, so maybe point it to you behind you. Um, but that that the ten lessons for a post-pandemic world. It really is a very thought-provoking work. I could continue this for another hour easily, out of respect for your time and everybody who's joined us. I'd like to close with a a couple of just quick elements from the book. I. I dog-eared so many pages and underlined so many elements, but then came upon an area where I wanted to make sure that I covered this before we closed. It said that this book has described the world that is being ushered as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is really describing forces that are gathering steam. Things are already changing. The novel coronavirus has upended society. People are disoriented. And in that atmosphere, further change becomes easier than ever. So now that turns positive. These changes could be the start of something new or momentary blips. We have many futures in front of us. We could turn inward and embrace nationalism and self-interest, or we could view this global pandemic as a spur to global cooperation and action. We could settle into a world of slow growth, increasing natural dangers and rising inequalities and continue with business as usual. Or we could choose to act forcefully, using the vast capacity of government to make massive new investments to equip people with the skills and security they need in an age of bewildering change. I will tell you that the hallmark of American University, of the Kogod School of Business, is to have business used for meaningful change, that people come to school in Washington, D.C., they come to American University to make a difference, to make a real difference, to make things better. This book of 10 lessons for a post-pandemic world that you've written just gives people a real scope, a real idea of what they need to keep their eye on and not be distracted by all of the day-to-day -day distractions, but instead keep their eye on the bigger issues of inequality, of globalism, of China, of being fair to your neighbor and the importance of the social contract that you have with others. On behalf of the Kogod School, and American University, I'd really like to thank you for spending the time with all of us and best wishes on a successful sale of this book. I hope everybody reads it and that we all act accordingly. Thank you for reading. Jim, it's a huge pleasure to be with you and thank you to everyone. I really have appreciated this. And with that, I will close us off and hope to see you again soon.